This Todd Fryall video is titled Ken Ham vs. Matt Walsh, and the winner is... Ray Comfort had it posted on his Twitter as a great teaching on the Old Earth, New Earth debate. I thought it was an actual debate, and I thought it would be long and tedious, but comical. And yep, I took the bait. Though it isn't a debate, it also isn't long. It's only seven and a half minutes. What I find most comical is how worked up some believers get over this issue. Let's analyze this. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. Shout out to new member Donald Numskull and new patron Oz Tang. Thank you both. Today, Todd Fryle is going to tell us why his version of Christianity is the right way to do Christianity, but some believers do it wrong. There you are, digging a really groovy teacher on the internet, and then you hear these fateful words. Chapter one, I don't think, is intending to teach us that God made the world in six consecutive 24-hour days. Ow! Oh, if that doesn't just burn your biscuits, nothing can chafe us theologically quite like hearing someone we respect say the creation account is simply poetic or allegorical. There are lots of big names who think exactly that. William Lane Craig, Norman Geisler, J.P. Moreland, Hugh Ross, Lee Strobel, and a slew of others. Indeed, which is exactly why Young Earth broke for me. I didn't abandon Christianity. I didn't even abandon biblical inerrancy, as I had plenty of company. Young Earth broke for me because those teaching it made the mistake of making a falsifiable claim. The claim was that fish cannot grow lungs and eventually crawl out of the water. Made sense. Fish have gills. Fish cannot grow lungs. Then I went to the shed aquarium, and there they were. Lungfish. The young earthers lied, or at least they were so poorly informed that they didn't know that not only can fish grow lungs, that fish with lungs are still alive today. I was seeing them right before my eyes. I could not deny their existence. Thus, the young earthers did not know what they were talking about. So I checked out the old earthers, and this seemed to be a far more educated group. Thus, I adopted an old earth position. I'm wondering if there is a falsifiable claim that Frail could have broken for him so that he could come closer to reality. Ken Ham is very careful. His people very rarely make falsifiable claims, because when they do, they are shown up. A recent example is beyond the understanding of many lay people, myself included. I only understand it because Dr. Dan of Creation Myths explained it in this video, at a level that non-science people like me can understand. Dr. Dan was able to question Dr. Jensen live on his new book, traced human DNA's big surprise, where Jensen makes the claim that genetics shows that humans can have a common ancestor just 6,000 years ago. Dr. Dan read the book and found a problem with Jensen's calculations on fixation rates. On air, Jensen admitted that he used the substitution rate as the fixation rate to arrive at his calculations. In other words, to make his theory work, every gene change in the species would have to become fixated in the population of the species in order for the theory to work. If that is confusing to you, watch Dr. Dan's video. It is excellent and you don't need a science background to understand it. The point is, young earth only works when you keep it theoretical. Once you make a falsifiable claim, you're toast. You're toast! Ah! Oh yeah, baby! The Bible doesn't insist the earth is young. It says in the beginning God creates the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say what that time that was at. I am not a young earth creationist. I do not believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. I believe that uh, that view is not only scientifically wrong, but I also think it's theologically wrong. I think it, I think it is a misinterpretation, a misreading 
a misunderstanding of the text. While we cannot read hearts, despite what CRT tells us, I suspect most Christian thinkers who reject a young earth model do it because it's just really hard to reconcile all that science with a young earth position. Yes, it really is. It doesn't take much to debunk young earth. It's why even amateurs like me can do it. I usually stay away from the science and prefer to pick apart the theology, which is just as bad, but occasionally they overlap. Just as Darwin had to somehow harmonize creation without a creator, professing Christians feel like they have to find a way to mush together old earth science and a young earth genesis. The way Fryle has phrased this, you can see his bias for the young earth side. He declares science to be old earth science. Science is neutral on the old earth, young earth proposition. It provides the method for testing the hypotheses on both sides. It's just when old earth hypotheses are tested, they are usually proven valid. I say usually because certainly not every idea for an old earth has been proven correct. For young earth, however, I am aware of no hypothesis that has ever been proven to be true through the scientific method that would validate a young earth position. So I see why Fryle thinks science, therefore, is old earth science. It would be like disputing that the earth is round and then dismissing all scientific discoveries that prove a spherical earth to be spherical earth science. What Frau should say is that believers need to find a way that their Bible can be interpreted to fit the reality we find ourselves in. The difference, as I see it, is old earthers at least make the attempt. To do so, they have to ignore some things that still don't fit their Bibles. Like you saw last week with Inspiring Philosophy, trying to reconcile the story of the sun standing still for Joshua with the reality that the earth revolves around the sun. But the young earthers are far worse. To be a young earther, you have to stick your head in the sand and pretend that reality just doesn't exist. Only the Bible is real, and everything else in reality must be viewed through that lens. Ken Ham quite blatantly says just that. Unfortunately for them, there's a rather large fly in that ointment. I suspect another popular reason for rejecting young earth is that the age of the earth is believed to be just not that important. If you want to think the earth is 6,000 years or 6 million or billion years, what difference does it make? Answer, a lot. The difference is whether or not your mind is open to truth and reason. If you think truth to be irrelevant, then it makes no difference. You can live in whatever fantasy world you want as long as you recognize that your world and the real world are not the same. You can't then claim to know the truth and the truth has set you free or that you worship in spirit and truth if truth is irrelevant to you. What is truth? That which comports to reality. If you have to shut your mind to reality to hold to your worldview, you can't also claim that your worldview is true. If your mind is open to truth and reason, you can't also hold to a young earth view as it doesn't comport with reality. Let us endeavor to line up a number of arguments that will hopefully convince you to read Genesis not as poetry and not as allegory, but as real historical narrative. Number one, poetry is a specific genre of literature that evokes an, an imaginative picture in our brains, an emotional response using language carefully selected, arranged for meaning and sound and rhythm. This is an example of biblical poetry. <clears throat> the mountains skip like rams, the hills like little lambs. Genesis 1 to 3 doesn't read like poetry. Does Frile think the Old Testament was originally written in English? I mean, yes, the English translations of Genesis don't have the meter of poetry. But did it in the original Hebrew? I don't know, and I don't really care. But to read an English translation of a work and declare that it isn't poetry because it doesn't have the meter of poetry in the translation, 
but not show that it doesn't have that meter in the original language is just sloppy, lazy work. Ryle has shown us nothing because he's failed to demonstrate that this is true in the original language, that it isn't poetry. This is your own Bible, man. Did no one tell you that it wasn't originally written in English? On the other hand, why would I expect anything different from a young earther? Number two, historical narrative. How do we know an author is trying to convey actual history? Well, they use specific details, proper names, accurate descriptions of reality. And that's how Genesis 1 to 3 reads. Geographical details, actual names, actual people. Okay, so because Harry Potter references real places like London, France, and Russia, and real people like the Prime Minister, thus Harry Potter is historical. Little Orphan Annie references New York and President Roosevelt, so Little Orphan Annie must be historical. Sumunk Kids' The Invention of Wings is historical because it is about a real person and references real places. You get the point. To be historical, a work must also fit into what we know of history. And while what we know for the time period of the Old Testament, particularly Genesis, is not thorough, it's also not a blank slate either. For example, we know that the pyramids were built in Egypt. There is no denying this. They are still there. We can go and see them today. The historical records written by the Egyptians tell us much about the time of building of those pyramids. For those for which we have no written records, there are still the artifacts inside and the historical evidence surrounding the area. You know one thing the pyramids tell us certainly? That there was no global flood. There wasn't even a local flood, at least not one big enough to encompass and wipe out Egypt. The Egyptians managed to keep building pyramids all through two of the periods that young earthers claim was when the flood took place. Yes, even among young earthers, there is no agreement on when the global flood is supposed to have happened. There is a third position that solves the problem by putting the flood at 3000 BCE. They do it by finding a major translation error in the Bible that changes much of the Genesis timeline. Were the pyramids built before the flood? This is not the only thing that the Masoretic text has dropped out. There are other things the Masoretic text has dropped out causing major distortions in the biblical timeline, and these distortions make it seem like the pyramids were built before the flood. And so according to these three witnesses, and a little common sense, the original Hebrew text included an extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. But more than a thousand years later, when the Hebrew Masoretic text was copied, those extra hundred years were dropped off of those ages. And since all of our Bibles are translated from this corrupted copy of the Hebrew, then all of our Bibles are missing those extra hundred years which has grossly distorted our understanding of the biblical timeline. Time when the flood occurred, the very first Egyptian pyramid would not be built until another 550 years into the future, not hundreds of years in the past. Apparently, atheists have done the math and have decided that 100 years was not enough time for the population to have grown from 8 people to a large enough number in order to build the Tower of Babel. After all, if the Great Pyramid of Khufu required 30,000 workers, well then surely the Great Tower of Babel would have required many more workers than that. But you simply cannot get that many workers in only 100 years. Even if you go with a very generous growth rate of 3.2%, which is the growth rate of some of the most fastest growing countries in our world today, and you start with the 8 people who came off the ark, then in 100 years you'd only end up with about 186 people. 186, that's it. That is simply not enough people to build a city with an enormous tower. I may not be an expert on population growth rates, but I'd say these atheists have a pretty valid argument. However, according to these three witnesses, the original Hebrew text included an extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. And when you put those extra hundred years back onto those ages, then you'll find there's about a 400 year time period in between the flood in Noah's day and the birth of Peleg. I think that 400 years is plenty of time for the population to have grown to a large enough size in order to build the Tower of Babel. After all, if you go with the exact same growth rate of 3.2% and you start with the 8 people who came off the ark, then in 400 years you'd end up with about 2.3 million people. And while making those changes makes it possible for a flood and for the pyramids to be built, 
but only provided that you ignore the following problems. First, the Giza pyramids were not the first pyramids built in Egypt. If the flood was in 3000 BCE and the first pyramids were built 400 years later, you need 100 years until the Babel dispersion, so now you need to grow the population of Egypt from zero to about 20,000 in 300 years because you need to have a people group to build the pyramid. This is where it gets tricky. If you assume a growth rate of 2%, at the end of 300 years, you have 3,041 people, assuming two families migrated to Egypt at the dispersion with eight people, all adults of childbearing years. If you take it to a 3% growth rate, then you have 56,788 people. Now you do have enough people to build the pyramids. But this is an unrealistic growth rate. If this was in fact the growth rate, then the current population of Egypt would be this number. I don't even have any idea on how to say that number, but it far exceeds the current number of people on Earth. In fact, there are 10 to the 30th power bacteria on Earth. There would have to be twice as many people in Egypt today as there are bacteria on the planet. Or, there are 10 to the 57th atoms in the sun. There would have to be more people in Egypt today than there are atoms in the sun. Or, if each of these people were a gallon of water, they would fill the entire Milky Way galaxy. So you see, the one percentage point in population growth makes a huge difference. I'm sure the apologist would argue that God sped up the growth rate for this time period to make it all work, and then slowed it back down to the normal rate. But this is just a God in the gaps argument, as there is nothing to support it. Finally, to even get to this point, you have to accept that the Bible contains serious errors because of the copying errors. This is easy to accept as it happened all the time, but it calls into question all of the rest of the text. If a god wants us to accept that his holy book is inerrant, then it can't have copying errors. I would not throw out an ancient text just because it contained some errors. But when the text makes fantastical claims of events not possible without supernatural intervention, and it contains errors, I have no reason to think it accurate on its claims of the supernatural events, at least not without some strong corroborating evidence. And we don't have that. Quite the contrary. The physical evidence we find says that it's all just a story. So once again, Friel fails to support his claim. Besides, if Genesis 1-3 to isn't historical narrative, then how do we know any text in the Bible is factual, including... Uh, the Gospels. Yep, Frile is spot on here. This is why when biblical inerrancy fell for me, the whole house of cards collapsed. I no longer had any basis to believe any of it. Number three, a yom is a yom. Some Christians who reject a young earth position argue that the Genesis creation account is just a very long amount of time, maybe millions or billions of years per day. Is that interpretation faithful to the text and Hebrew grammar? That would be a big negatory, my trucker friend. Moses uses numbers to describe each passing day on the first day, on the second day. He uses language to describe morning and evening of each day. You have to have a fair amount of imagination to overcome the Hebrew word for day, yom, which means yom. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day, Second Peter 3.8. It's right there in your Bible, dude. Number four, ra oh, if we evolved, then what do we do with? Adam, Romans 5, says that through one man, that would be Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. In Adam, if death weren't present in the world before Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, there's no possibility for the life, the death, and natural selection of creatures before the fall. And he does have a point here. I was an old earther. I was never able to reconcile human evolution with the Garden of Eden. But then again, 
I never tried. I accepted that human evolution was real, and I accepted that the Garden of Eden story was real, and I never thought about the fact that these two contradict one another, just as I was sufficiently versed in ancient history to know that there was no period of time when there were no humans on the face of the earth after human evolution, and I believe that there was a global flood, but I never put these two ideas together as being incompatible not until Aaron Ra pointed it out for me, which was the aha moment that was the end of my faith. If you are wondering, how can that be possible, to hold two ideas that are completely contradictory and yet not realize that they are so, it has to do with the different ways that some people's brains work. Mine builds on what it has, each bit of information being added into the folders of the information in my brain information added to one folder that is open at the moment, but not to any other folders. I came to realize that not all people think this way as I watched my second child grow. When she gets a concept, her brain draws all the information about that concept from the other areas of her brain that already have information about it. I cannot do that. I have to think about each area separately. It's why she learns so much faster than I do. And it's why she can solve a Sudoku or any other puzzle in half the time that it takes me. So if you're trying to explain to a friend why young Earth doesn't work, sometimes you have to be explicit in how the story doesn't match with reality. When you strike one that they will know you are right about, they are likely to get the connection that they previously missed. Some old Earthers and theistic evolutionists, they would say Adam and Eve were simply the product of millions millions and millions of years of evolution prior to the story of them in the garden. There's just one big problem. There are more, but let's focus on one. If we believe, Paul, that death entered when sin did, there can't be millions of years of evolution because that requires lots of death prior to the fall. I find this claim ironic. On this side of his mouth, Ryle says that death entering the world must mean physical death. Yet, when you point out what God told Adam about the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, and yet Adam and Eve ate of it and did not die. Ryle will quickly change to the other side of his mouth and say that this means spiritual death, and that at the moment they ate of the fruit, they died spiritually. Yet somehow, when Paul talks about the same event, somehow Paul can't possibly be referring to spiritual death. Huh. Adam and Eve were unique creations, not the product of evolution. This is actually a bold assertion in the face of all the evidence against such a notion. The most compelling for me is endogenous retroviruses. Why would a God that created humans as a unique creation include in our DNA evidence of viruses passed down in gene markers on the same gene and in the same location as they are in other primates from which we evolved? If we didn't evolve from these primates, why did your God work so hard to deceive us into making it look as if we did? Further, where do you draw the line between uniquely created humans and other hominid species? Are Neanderthals part of the unique human creation? Denisovans, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and so on. If you look at all the members of the great ape clade, where do you draw the line on which ones were God's unique human creation? And why do you draw the line there? Most likely, Freil has never heard of Denisovans or Homo habilis, or if he has, he let it go in one ear and out the other without ever allowing it to cloud his god vision. Maybe he has a god shield that keeps out all the facts that would show his religious beliefs to be wrong. If I had a chance to say that to his face, he would likely agree and say that it is called the shield of faith. Number five, if Genesis 1 to 3 is poetry, then you've been getting ripped off on the Sabbath if you're only celebrating it for 24-hour days and God potentially rested for millions of years. 
Contact your boss and tell him or her that you will not be in the office until, mm, give or take, 700 million and 42,000 A.D. The Sabbath was an actual day of actual rest, and that is why we only take 24 hours off. Okay, that was pretty funny. I would be willing to bet that most employers would be fine with you taking such an extended Sabbath. But I don't expect that you would be paid for that leave. Most people don't get paid for their days off. If I was defending this as a believer, I would simply argue that yes, to God a day is a thousand years, but if he tells us to take a day, he means a human day, not a God day. After all, we are not gods. Um, except when the Bible kind of says that we are and Jesus agreed with it. But we can pretend that isn't in the Bible. That can't be literal because some, um, um, we don't agree with that one. I get it. I really, really do. The pressure to not look foolish because science says the earth is old. Yes, it does look foolish when you tell the vast majority of people educated in multiple fields of study that they are all wrong because you have, in your ancient book, written long before these things were discovered, says differently. If you take that stance, you deserve to be patted on the head, given a lollipop, and sent to the children's table. You are a Neanderthal, if there were such things. Wow. Okay, I was not expecting this. Now I know how Frile draws the line between humans and other hominids. He denies their existence. But Neanderthals? I mean, really? Even I learned about these in junior high. Frile is four years younger than me, so this was in the public schools when he was in school. Maybe he went to a religious school that skipped that part, or worse, maybe he was homeschooled. But don't you remember the Geico commercials with the caveman from 20 years ago? Those were Neanderthals. Geico.com, you can handle all your car insurance needs online. It's so easy, a caveman could do it. <laughs> Seriously, we apologize. We had no idea you guys were still around. Yeah, next time maybe do a little research. <laughs> Gentlemen, are we ready to order? I'll have the roast duck with the mango salsa. Don't you remember earlier when you gave the criteria for determining what is historical? Well, by your own definition, you can't deny the historicity of Neanderthals. We have the Neanderthal genome. Modern humans have made it with Neanderthals. Denying they exist is like denying the existence of an inconvenient cousin, but also convincing yourself that it is true if there were such things, for believing the earth is young. But that's what Genesis 1 to 3 teaches. And if that makes us look like fools, then so be it. Okay, you heard him. Todd Frile looks like a fool for denying the existence of reality. He understands that that is what he is doing, and he accepts that if it looks as foolish as it really is, he is ready to bear the moniker. If his God requires him to bear this moniker, then his God is just as foolish. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the insignificant things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no human may boast before God. Got it. Your God is so insecure in his intelligence that he is willing to make his own followers look like fools so that he can look wise by comparison. What a petty God. The rest of his video is just commercials. So who won the debate? The old earthers or the young earthers? Considering that we ended up with no support for either side, they both lose. I've never seen that before. A debate with no winner, just losers. Come to think of it. We started off with Matt Walsh and Ken Ham. Why would I have expected anything else? Live your life.
that makes us look like fools, then so be it.